Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. It is the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and we have a great show planned for you today where, first of all, I hope all of you had a great weekend and you are coming back and you are ready to go. Uh, We're going to make Monday a little better for you because, hey, uh, the show today will include in the second part, computer and technology news, and that is where everything and anything having to do with news. So that's uh, you know some of the stories that we're going to be going over that you should definitely check out uh, include the fact that Fox you know them they make movies they own like everything uh, well Fox and subsidiary of Disney who owns everything I'm sorry the mouse owns everything um, yeah we're gonna talk about how they have an artificial intelligence that can actually predict if you're going to actually go see a movie or not so now they hold all the cards we're also going to talk about a fake ios phishing scam that will attempt to connect you to a fake technical support so yep lots of that and more uh coming up in computer technology news and uh i'm gonna say this and it's gonna relate to our first hour our first half hour guest which is brought to you by owc so in the first half hour we are going to be talking with uh with mr larry o'connor and he is uh the founder and ceo of of, of course, OWC Digital. And, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about just what they do there, the new products that they have, and so much more. Also, MaxSales.com. So, uh, yeah, a couple of things before we jump into that, though, including ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything from links, uh, the show notes, articles, videos, the live video feed, uh, the social media contest brought to you by Logitech, all that and more. You can find that at our website. So with that being said, let's just go ahead and jump right into this and waiting patiently in the wings is the man himself. So as I said before, OWC and Larry is joining us. And uh, yeah, so why don't we go ahead and bring him on. Larry, how are you doing? Welcome back onto the show. Thanks for joining us. Hey, really, really well. Hopefully uh, the service room at will cooperate. I hope so, too. Uh, But you sound pretty good, and I think we're going to be able to do the interview. So let's go ahead and uh, just give us a little bit of background on OWC as a company, because you guys have been around for 25-plus years. Yeah, actually, we're in our 30th year, and uh, we've had a primary focus on, very simply, uh, taking technology further, whether it be upgrades or external docks or external storage means you can connect up to your system to make it better than it was when you first got it. Perfect, perfect. And yeah, I, I mean, uh, of course, there's going to be a lot more to it uh, to that. But uh, talk about the, um, you know, kind of the first thing that jumps out I mean, to. I'm, I, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I lost you there for just a moment. Oh, no problem, no problem. So uh, before we go any further, we should probably explain the, uh, you know, what's going on here with uh, with OWCDigital.com and MaxSales.com. Are they the same business? Is one the retail side? Uh, talk about uh, your website. Sure, MaxSales.com is, you know, was established way back in the 90s. You know, uh, we were is a direct to market organization, you know, but the resellers were direct customers. You know, Max Sales uh, today is a, a it remains a an e commerce you know operation. We have you know great salespeople, great customer support. You know, folks are there to help you upgrade your Mac and and not even your PC and Linux boxes. You know, at MaxSales.com, you can find all the OWC hardware as well as a third party product. We also have used Macs there as well with great configuration options. But OWC Digital, you know, we kind of split off from our operation a couple of years ago, actually about five years ago, to do a better job supporting the channel. We've got great channel partners that are reselling our product. Um, this was, how to say, uh, OWC has always been the brand. So that OWC Digital, you will find all the great products that we're innovating, that we design and develop. And the, OWC, the products you find on OWC Digital 
you can also find from major resellers, you know, not just in the U.S., but around the world. Very, very cool. Thank you for explaining that. So let's um, let's talk about, uh, I, I think some of the most fun things include the newest and shiny things. Uh, Apple has a couple of announcements, and so obviously supporting Macs yourself. Uh, this starts to, I think, get into people's minds where, you know, maybe they have an older Mac and the new generation is coming, is coming out. Their current Mac is feeling a little old, sluggish, uh, that kind of deal. Um, talk about, you know, maybe what people should look into when they want to extend the lifespan of their Mac. Because, you know, a lot of people, they spend a lot of money and, uh, you know, and they wouldn't mind getting a couple more years out of a Mac. Uh, what are some of the first places you send people to try to, you know, refurbish a Mac? Well, truth be told, these systems last a very, very long time when it comes to a Mac. I mean, it's not uncommon to see a system, you know, whether it's three years, five years, even 10 years old, still in service and, and doing a great job. You know, on the older systems, you have the ability to upgrade memory. That's mostly 2012 and prior models. That's a huge thing. Uh, if you haven't replaced, and I say it all the time, but it's amazing how many people still have hard drives in their systems. If you've not replaced a hard drive with an SSD with a, a solid state drive, you know, that's a huge upgrade for an older system. And, you know, a lot of folks ask, do you have an SSD? They say yes. Do you have a hard drive? They say yes. You know, definitely check and see what you have. It's a night and day difference between a solid state drive and a hard drive. And if you are selling a hard drive and everything else seems like it's, you know, your applications you want to run still work just fine and it is really just some more speed, you know, a solid state drive, you know, will make that machine brand new and for a lot less than buying a new system today. As you get into... Uh, yeah, and oh, and you know, just kind of want to jump in there for just a moment. And uh, you're, you know, the whole talk about storage, and yes, the uh, the traditional hard drive to the SSD that's a huge upgrade. I see here though that um, I, I believe I saw it on your homepage there at Mac Sales, where um, I'm sorry, is where you are offering, if I'm not mistaken, M.2s. So that's a newer technology that I think even people wouldn't be familiar with. Uh, you know, kind of, even if they are familiar with an SSD, maybe not an M.2. Uh, are you offering those and why should people, or, you know, do, do you like them? Because personally, I I have one and I I love the darn thing. Well, the M.2s, I mean, is the, is the, or a PCI SSD that is going to apply to the most of, most of the 2013 and later uh, Mac models. And we have the Aura and the Aura Pro X for upgrading those systems. And that's something else that people, you know, don't necessarily realize, but when you start to run out of storage, you fall under 10% uh, available, or when you drop down, I mean, uh, when you once you start to hit around 10%, things start to slow down in general. When you go, uh, let's say, below uh, 5%, 4%, now really get down, it can actually become, you know, it's, it becomes like a lasses. You know, the computer uses uh, paging space on the drive for its operation. And when there's not enough space to page and cache its operations, things get very, very sluggish. So a machine from 2013, 2014, 2015, that otherwise is great if you've filled up all the storage and you're, you're pretty much, you know, you're running on vapors when it comes to space for new files, just replacing the drive with one of these new M.2s, a P, it'd be a PCI or, or a Pro X for a Mac. You know, in addition to giving yourself more space, which is great for carrying around more of your you know, prize and valuable files, it also can give you a huge pickup in performance. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I recently uh, upgraded mine from an SSD and just a tiny one at that. I mean, maybe four or five years ago, I got into like a six, because it was so prohib uh, prohibitively expensive. Uh, I think like many people who first bought into computer or bought into SSDs, they bought very small ones and they just put their uh, their operating system on them. They didn't put a lot of their day-to-day -day operations, but I was able to pick up, uh, you know, uh, an M.2 for a much more affordable price than, you know, what used to be $2 a gig. Now it's uh, closer to like 50 cents a gig and some places even lower. So it's, um, you know, definitely, definitely worth looking into. And uh, again, you're kind of, 
uh, differentiating what people should look at based on what model they have. Obviously, when you refurbish, that's important. Uh, do you have any tools or a hotline or anything to kind of help people, you know, kind of through this process? Because, you know, knowing exactly what you currently have, what year you have, that can get a little confusing. Certainly, uh, our website uh, has, again, the maxsales.com has a, a very extensive compatibility guide. I mean, you select which system you have, it lines you up with not just what the, the right upgrades are, but also lets you follow through and see videos and such that will show you how to do the upgrade. These upgrades are, are really simple once you see how, how to do them, and the videos, of course, make that very easy, and, and getting the right drive is important as well. And as you mentioned, uh, SSDs, flashes come down a long way. I mean, stuff right now is it's, it's about 50 cents a gig versus a couple of dollars a gig. It used to be $500 just to go from a 256 up to a, actually 128, sorry, up to a, a 512. Today, you can buy a new one terabyte. And for about 500 plus, you have the old drive, which if you get a kit from us, you can put in an external enclosure, transfer your data, and then you have a, an external drive for backup for other files and well, whatever else you may need uh, you know, pass external storage for. But uh, in a, you know, again, it's you know, really dragging us. portion of the files from your drive as well. You don't want to be operating with less than 10% free space on, in any uh, circumstance because once you get there, things start to, will start to drag. So that's, that's a quick fix, you know, for a few people at least. Right. And, and you know, actually a funny story uh, with what actually happened to me was uh, my SSD, like I said, I think was like a 64 gig or something even lower. And it was about the same time as Windows 10 was pushing out from Windows uh, you know, from Windows 7, well, I was using Windows 7 to Windows 10, and the hard drive was so small that it couldn't download all the files for Windows 10, and it couldn't back up its own files, and essentially it couldn't save everything because it didn't have enough space to even offload everything at once and it was such a such a hassle you don't want to put yourself in a bind uh having that space and one thing that we've been doing uh we reviewed uh, an owc product a little while ago uh, you know had a lot of fun in fact incorporated it into uh the hive mind here where now we use it to back up uh computer america shows after every show we keep the the video and the audio recording things like that and it's one of your external drives because you know we like to take the show on the road sometimes it's uh it's very helpful that we're able to just kind of unplug one hard drive and everything stays put uh talk about some of your external hard drives i believe we were checking out the mercury elite pro and i mean it looks uh, talk about the looks of the thing and talk about uh external storage in general should people consider getting external storage well, you absolutely at some point have to have some sort of external storage, and it should be good external storage because you should be doing a good backup. Now, no matter you know what your uh, internal situation is, you must have an external drive for backup. Cloud is great. I mean, a tertiary backup. I, I certainly encourage having a cloud-based uh, backup for your uh, files, but nothing beats having a local backup. In the morning, you can have everything backed up. You're not limited in time and uh, bandwidth in terms of what can get up on the cloud. And number two, when you know something, if some issue does not pop up, and you're not dependent upon the uh, you know, getting it back off the cloud to get yourself back online. And the other uh, detail, you look at something like Time Machine uh, on the Apple platform, you know, that does you know, versioning of your file. So if you've got multiple versions, if you've deleted something you know, a month ago, you know, two weeks ago by accident, or made a change you didn't need, need, uh, mean to make and saved over a file. You know, Time Machine on a local level gives you the ability to go pull a different version back online and, and move forward as opposed to, you know, losing, you know, whatever you had two weeks or three weeks or a month ago. And you need external storage for that. Now, for systems, especially in the newer systems where you don't even have the option to upgrade internally, it's soldered. I mean, a lot of the new Macs, you know, starting in 2016, actually, every is all you're going to have. And that's the same uh, with certain PCs as well. If you do not have the option to upgrade, you can look at high-speed storage from you know, the USB-C, the Elite Pro. Minis are great portable storage. They can come with SSDs or hard drives, and depending on what your needs are, you can have certain data. You know, on a hard drive, that's just fine. And keep all the stuff you need for editing, all the, if you're doing music libraries, if you're doing Photoshop, where you, again, what you're editing, video, what you're editing should be on that fast drive. You know, completed work can then be on your hard, you know, slower hard drive, because today's drives are plenty fast for 
any of the playback. It's where you get in editing or live, you know, how to say, instrumentation files and such, things that are active that have to be loaded quickly and or, and, or edited you know, on the fly that really need that SSD. But you know, going back to the external storage, you know, the Elite Pro Mini is very fast. It's truly a rugged drive. Is a, an example. In fact, the, uh, out in Africa, they did a they actually landed a helicopter on that board of the drives just to show, you know, <laughs> they say how strong those drives are. <laughs> kind of an interesting uh, that they offered. They said, hey, you know, they had data, live data on it, but you know, they're built, you know, to protect your data. Yeah, they're built to keep you reliable operation. Yeah, it certainly sounds like I, I mean, I, I guess most people just run them over with trucks, but I guess landing a helicopter is going to do, uh, you know, get the same point across. And, and yeah, and, and I guess that's one thing that, uh, you know, that, that you guys really pride yourself on is the fact that the general rate that hard drives fail just because memory comes from a lot of different sources. Uh, just buying the cheapest hard drive, I know that in some cases, uh, you know, a hammer is a hammer, a screwdriver is a screwdriver, a hard drive is a hard drive. But a lot, you know, some of this memory comes, or some of the storage, I'm sorry, comes from places that you don't really use inferior uh, production methods. They use a bad, uh, I'm sorry, that they use bad um, uh, base material, things like that. And the rate of failure can vary anywhere from like, you know, 4%, 6%, you know, uh, year over year. You do some testing, though, that, you know, so that obviously whatever you want to store on there isn't going to crash and the whole thing isn't going to go under, uh, correct? We do a lot in terms of the the chipset selection, the power supply, and that's not just the external power supply, even the internal power bridge, you know, the drive longevity. And, you know, that is important. I mean, this is, you know, you, a loss of a, a uh, of, of any drive can be, you know, a pretty uh, painful, painful experience. And we really build things to last. I mean, we're selecting drives based on the reliability, but we're also you know, going into the uh, you know, the enclosure, you know, what the bridge that goes between the drive and your computer. You know, there's a lot of protection, a lot of design that, that goes in there to once again ensure these products are robust, rugged, and will go the distance. And the other uh, kind of another detail, you know, sometimes things happen externally that are beyond our control. USB can glitch and surge. I mean, there's we don't have control over what things are plugged into, but you know the Bridges that are quite, quite honestly to take the uh, take the abuse, and in the worst case scenario, the drives that we use can be taken out and put into another enclosure. You know, a lot of the very low cost product that's on the market today now have integrated USB controllers, so you don't have a SATA drive in a enclosure. You've got something that's got a it's a SATA drive, but it has the USB to SATA bridge built right into the uh, mounted right on the drive. A failure uh, in that particular scenario, pretty much. The major data recovery is that recovery house at that point you're going to. You know, we want to make sure that things are, number one, built to last, and number two, you know, wherever we can control it, you know, get the best opportunity you know, for easy recovery as well. So there's, there's different levels and different layers, but ultimately, you know, we really we care about our customers' data, and we definitely uh, you know, watch out and you know, take make decisions at different points that put our customers' data in the best possible place. Right. And then, of course, you have plenty of options looking at some of these. Uh, you also serve enterprise and business solutions as well, which is yeah. why I, I was kind yeah, of... Well, you can go all the way up to the latest. You look at the USB-C, you know, how to say deals for folks with USB Type-C, you know, for Mac users and PCs with Thunderbolt, the new Envoy Pro uh, EX Thunderbolt 3 SSDs, they started about 250 and they go up to two terabytes. They are super fast. They're as fast as your internal drive. You plug them in and connect them externally. So, you know, kind of talking about some of the new machines where you limited solder drive has, now you can just plug it in a bus powered compact solution that also can pretty well be run over by a trucker or landed on with a helicopter <laughs> and have uh, another up to two terabytes of yeah. SSD performance plus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm certainly looking at that one. And then uh, another thing that catches my eyes, of course, is the fact that you also offer a 40 terabyte solution. Obviously, I don't think any sane person, uh, the, uh, there are plenty of insane people that are storing, I don't know what for, but 40 terabytes in one single unit, it's more of a server rack than anything else. But, um, and then also, I guess, from the consumer side, you also have, uh, I think it's like an eight terabyte or uh, I'm sorry, a 24 terabyte uh, solution that's more, I wouldn't say consumer based, but, you know, uh, home professional, let's say that. So you have a lot, well, a lot know, of single, sizes. Yeah. 
for single, yeah, for single and multi bay solutions, and you get multi bay, you know, there's built in redundancies, but you know, single, you know, you know, from 500 gigs up to 12 terabytes day, and uh, multi uh, drive solutions, you know, now you're talking up to up to 48 terabytes today, and another couple of days up to uh, 72 terabytes. But yeah, you know, and again, when you look at the multi bay, the multi bay solutions give you give people the opportunity to suffer. You know, it's not, with a high anything that's spinning, I mean, a mechanical device, it's not going to be and then it's a, uh, if it's going to fail, so when it's going to fail. And it's not, I mean, the odds in the near term are pretty low, but you get to three years, four years, five years, you know, those probabilities go up you know, with use. And with a multi-drive solution, you know, these are built where when a drive fails, you have redundancy. So your data is still accessible and your data is, is still safe. You can replace the drive that's failed and restore uh, that redundancy without having to uh, start from scratch. But you know, taking a look in terms of you know, who's doing what, Hey, it's amazing how quickly uh, you know, things like, especially if you got a family with a, a bunch of uh, you know, devices, how fast phone, you know, mobile device backups can you know t- start to eat up storage. How, how fast, you know, GoPro, you know, family vacations, and you know, you got those all the drone footage that people capture, and that's just consumer stuff. I mean, that that eats up space really, really quick for folks that are into uh, you know, those you know so, sorts of hobbies and such. Photographs are becoming higher and higher resolution. They chunk through data really, really quick. So it's insane amounts of data. Certainly, when you look at you know, where we were just you know, three or four years ago, but the files have gotten much bigger, and storage has gotten so much cheaper. I mean, two terabytes you know, was a few hundred dollars you know, less than a decade ago. Actually, two terabytes didn't exist as a single drive until about 2011, right. 2012. Today, I mean, you're at 12 terabytes for a comparable cost. So data has gotten bigger, but it's gotten a lot it's but expensive, and on that note, when you know, talking about backups, as inexpensive as storage is today, you know, there's absolutely no good reason not to have a good backup. Right, good backup, and then another part of that puzzle that you're kind of uh, talking about there is the fact that you know they used to take forever. Data transfer rates were incredibly slow. Uh, USB t- 2.0, I mean, it's uh, it, it, it's still in use, but compared to 3.0, 3.1. Uh, uh, I believe it's Thunderbolt as well. I mean, there's a lot more, I'm sorry, there's a lot better data transfer uh, solutions. And so if you get one of these large hard drives, I think another part, you know, another part of the population out there thinks, but backups take forever. It's going to take a long time. It's, uh, you know, it's going to take hours and then, uh, or some, or it's a lot of work. Uh, that's not the case either, is it? Like if you were to buy a large hard drive to do a backup, how long would you say it kind of takes someone from zero to backed up? You know, a, ter- a terabyte now is, you know, can be less than you know, 10, 15 minutes, depending upon the uh, solution. And, you know, you go back a few years, I mean, that was with a, certainly with USB 2, that was an hours uh, you know, kind of uh, and, uh, thing you'd be facing. So, you know, data can, data transfers very, very fast today with Thunderbolt and uh, USB, uh, certainly with USB, be three one Gen two technologies, but Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt two, Thunderbolt three, and you're up to now, you know, four gigabytes a second. So, and in a single minute, I mean, that's two hundred forty up to two hundred forty gigs in perfect conditions, and uh, yeah, that's every few seconds, that's a terabyte. So it's it's a definitely a different uh, different world today. Our data is much bigger, but the bandwidth we have to handle that data is is far far greater. Right. And, and, you know, you're talking about trends. That's one thing I'm, I'm excited for is the fact that I think up until now, we've had to do certain things such as, you know, film and lower resolution. 480p is still a thing. Uh, we've had to do a lot of compression algorithms to get storage to a manageable point. But that's what I'm excited for is storage kind of goes up. We can start to throw away some of these compression algorithms and just do things in, you know, lossless or raw, you know, kind of data. And it's it makes everything look a lot better, I, I guess. You don't get any of that noise or fuzz when it comes to videos and things like that. So there's, yeah, so absolutely. So there's that. Um, real quick before we move on to uh, memory. It's always nice to be able to have your... Go ahead. It's always nice to have you... Sorry, it's always nice to have your original work in an uncompressed format. I mean, at some point, you may want to share it, broadcast it, email, whatnot. That's a great time to compress and send. But for your own personal archive of your original stuff, the closer you are to raw, you know, the more flexibility you're going to have over the long term to you know, do whatever it is you'd like to do with that, that data and make the best of it. And if you compress it and you have to throw out your your original raw and never even capture in raw, 
you know, you're you're never going to have a have that source file. You, you, the source is gone. You know, you're compressed. What, what the compression algorithm you use today is is going to be the best it's ever going to look for the most part. Absolutely, and or sound. Yeah, yeah, no. So having all you know, just having the high, high quality, it's uh, super important, and we're going to see more of it. So, and, and as you said, things like drones. Uh, I, I, I think just being a hobbyist, or even just being a casual photographer, or movie shooter, what have you, that's going to mean something completely different here in the next couple of years. So, before we move on to uh, memory and things like that, I wanted to bring up one fact. I just I was just poking around. And, you know, we talk a lot about the fact that, you know, you are Mac sales and but you also offer things for or that work with the PC and Linux and, and what have you. But here's one that I didn't know about. You have an external PlayStation 4 uh, hard drive that you can hook up to, obviously, a PlayStation 4. And that's important because most games are simply downloaded nowadays. There's no CD that they actually are read from. Uh, talk about why you brought, brought something out for the PlayStation. Yeah, guys like to have fun too, and it was an internal project. And it was noted, hey, we can, especially on the internal side, and we've got external and internal. A lot of people like to keep things clean. They don't like to have extra things floating around that can be bumped or lost. But uh, they, you know, about four years ago, maybe three years ago, I could be exaggerating the time, say, hey, let's, let's do an upgrade for the PlayStation. And we put together a kit to make it very, very easy, you know, properly formatted, ready, you know, so the PlayStation could recognize it. So you could take out that smaller drive, put a bigger drive inside, up to two terabytes. And then use the existing drive external uh, you know, with the transfer tool. It comes with a, a little flash drive to help manage the, uh, like I say, what the PlayStation needs for the, uh, the drive. Well, but you know, we, we like doing these things. I mean, it's, it's stuff that our customers certainly benefit from and ask us for when they. You see space. And for the most part, if it's something we can do, we, we enjoy it. That, that fits into. Uh, a space that we have expertise in, and we have again, we have a large team that does a lot of great things. And this was one of those things that you know, effectively a team member said, "Hey, we can do this. I know how to do this. Let's let's make it. It's not super easy for folks, you know, out there typically, but we can make it really easy." And you know, we were glad to do it. Very very cool. Oh, and, and there's a video, and there's a video, of course. And uh, yeah, of course. So, and, and also, uh, actually, again, before we move on to memory, uh, m most recent announcement from Apple involved the MacBook Pro, and I bet that a lot of your products are, of course, going to be. Uh, the MacBook Pro is the professional level of their uh, of, of their laptop. You know, it's people who are going to be doing uh, work on the road. They're going to be doing editing. They're going to uh, you know try to do as much as they can with as you know in as clean a manner as possible. Because I feel like anyone else, they would uh, you know kind of buy a desktop you know kind of station. Um, so the MacBook Pro. Before we get going further. What do you think of it? Because it's uh, it, it has some hit or miss points to it, but it's a pretty beastly machine. No, the thing about Apple, the software is fantastic. The interface between Apple software and hardware is, quite uh, frankly, is, is better than anybody else's OS out there. You know, the, the big miss I think Apple's got today on all of their MacBook Pros is what they've soldered. You know, whether it be the memory being soldered, the, the, the hard drive, sorry, hard drive, the SSDs, the flash is all soldered. It's very important when you buy a MacBook or a MacBook Pro that you buy it with, you know, whatever you think you're going to need, you know, certainly in the uh, the near term, because you're not going to be able to upgrade it later. You know, storage, if you're out of storage, you know, the solution is external storage. Like you mentioned, you know, the Envoy 4X is a good option, or buying a new machine. You know, if you buy a machine today with 8 gigs and later decide you need 16, the only solution is to buy a new machine with 16. You know, they go up to 32 gigs today, which is a great upgrade. And you know, I highly recommend you know getting the maximum memory in those systems. Even if you know, you're not sure you're going to need the memory, but there are applications that will benefit from it. And when it comes to resale, there's a benefit to having 32 over 16 because again, it's something you can never change. You know, the biggest myth I have for those machines is simply that they're they're not upgradable. The second biggest myth, you know, the lack of ports. On a Pro machine, people really need more ports than Apple is giving, and whether it be you know, the MacBook or the MacBook Pros or a lot of the, uh, the also thin PCs. You know, now you just get a couple type C's and you know, you're going to have to have, if you want to have anything else plugged in or legacy USB 3 devices without having to buy a whole bunch of new cables, you know, at that point you need docks. And the good news is we have docks for Mac PCs and Linux machines, including the, uh, the Google Chromebooks that you know, are plug and play, whether it be a travel dock from 
run sixty dollars all the way up to full USB C docs and then about three docs that you know, can add all those USB threes, give you external video. Well and, you and Larry, and I'm uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and I'm gonna stop right there. Music playing in the background means that we have to take a break. <laughs> Would you mind joining us on the other side? I can do that, sure. Sure. All right, so everyone, uh we'll be right back. OWC, Max Sales, everyone, Computer America, stay tuned. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 minutes past the hour. And by the way, if you miss any part of today's show, you can always head on over to ComputerAmerica.com. And there you'll find the podcast, which is simply today's show in its entirety, rebroadcast wherever podcasts are heard. So, yeah, and we continue on. We have Larry from OWC, and he, and yeah, we are talking, uh, well, mainly about the MacBook Pro and, you know, some of the trends that I don't think are inherently new with the newest iteration of the MacBook Pro. It's been going this way for quite a while, but I guess a lot of people who are longtime Mac users, they, I, I, I guess they're kind of hoping for, you know, kind of a, back to an emphasis on computers and, you know, instead of them just being the afterthought after the phones and, uh, you know, and, and tablets and things like that. So, uh, Larry, again, thank you for joining us. And before the break, you were mentioning the fact that, uh, you know, first one, I believe you said it was like uh, not upgradable. Uh, you know, whatever you get, you get. And people should really consider that because that's going to affect resale value. Uh, the second thing was the lack of ports. And that's where docs come into play. Uh, yeah, and please continue on. Yeah, the good news is, again, there's a good variety of docs that we offer. I mean, we design docs that you know, meet you know, specific needs pretty broadly, and, and they're not just hubs. I mean, it's very important to note that, and there are a lot of docs out there that are really just glorified hubs. A doc has power delivery and management in it. It allows you to pass power to the doc, or the doc itself is able to provide power from its own power supply to the computer. And the big important thing there is because there's power delivery management, the ports that are available on the uh, on the the dock are going to function. You know, when you connect things into them, they're going to work the way they're supposed to work. You're not going to be in overpower situations, or in cases where stuff you know, even drops off when you're in the middle of doing something. But while there's only a couple ports on uh, the the new MacBook Pros have, you know, depending upon the model, two ports or four ports. The uh, the MacBook uh, uh, the uh, the 12 inch models only have one port. Now the again the good news there is you know we do have docs that you plug in and we'll give you a whole bunch of ports and without compromise and this is not just a Mac trend I mean Apple kind of sets the trend and you know PC makers have also you know started to go down this the same path you know the Chromebook is very limited in ports a lot of the thin PC Windows machines typically have just a couple or maybe up to four of the USB C ports 
you know, this is this is something that you know, is becoming more and more uh, typical, which is okay because, in, in fairness, when you're most folks, when you're in tra- when you're in transit, when you're in the field, you really don't need a whole lot of ports for anything, and then it's very convenient to be able to come back to your home, your office, whatever the work, wherever your workplace may be, connect one cable and suddenly be able to power the machine and connect up everything you need, whether it be an external display, whether it be you know, some external drive, an audio device, whatever your setup may have. You know, one cable today you know, can can actually do just about everything, which is something that is supported this year. I think Apple was ahead of the curve, you know, not to uh, anyone's real benefit in 2016 when they started to eliminate ports. But, you know, as we go forward, you know, we've, the bandwidth is there, the capability is there, so that it's not like it used to be where you go on the road and disconnect a whole bunch of different cables and devices. Now you can have a nice organized setup with a single dock. You come back in or you go between your office and your, uh, your home and plug in one cable and be completely online. Very, very cool. No, and and that's something that uh, I I think more and more people are doing, and uh, especially Mac is very good at their all in ones and uh, and the like. So I've definitely traveled with Macs before, and having a dock for that very reason, uh, it's it's kind of like you know taking your shoes off and slipping back into your slippers. It's uh, it, it's very convenient. So all right, and as I was saying, you know, we talked all about storage a little bit earlier. Uh, let's go ahead and speed on over to the memory in general. Uh, looking at the website now, anyone out there watching the video portion can see it. Uh, yeah, you offer, you know, looks to be just about every kind of memory all the way back to, wow, those are some old looking computers. Uh, the Power Mac G3. So, and I, I, I guess when should, like, what are some telltale signs that people need to look at upgrading memory? You know, you really you can take a look at the applications that you're loading. If you're loading large, you know, whether it be photo files, if you're doing music production, take a look at the instrumentation you're loading. Excel, how big are your, is your sheets? You have programs like Activity uh, Manager or I think it's Task Manager on the win- on Windows will show you what you know, applications are using, what memory to do their processes. But typically, I mean, unless you have, you know, the, in the case of a typical system that where 16 or 32 gigs might be your max. Unless you've got that 16 or 32 gigs, you can almost always use more memory. When you give a modern operating system more memory, it uses that memory pretty effectively to speed everything up. Now, not everything gets a benefit. It's just web browsing and, and basic word processing. You know, not so much there, but anything that involves the loading of files of any significant size. And remember, if you're editing, it, if it's a, you know, a one gig, uh, it's a, a, yeah, actually a one gigabyte, a really high resolution file, mm-hmm. to do the editing on that file. It needs the multiple you know, of that uh, that file's total size, you know, in free memory to make the changes before it resaves it. So, in general, you know, it's, if you have four gigs of memory, it's time. To, if you have less than four gigs of memory, it's you're way past uh, when you should have upgraded. If you have less than eight gigs of memory, again, it, there's very likely a benefit you know, for you to upgrade. If you have eight gigs or more, you know, the benefits start to taper off unless you're, guess what, you would consider yourself to be a power user. Or doing video editing and, and then going from 8 to 16 is always going to be a benefit, but it starts to uh, fall off from there. But right. in any case where you're working on large files where they can really draw down memory, you, know, you have a Mac Pro, which you can put up to 128 gigs, the price we offer. Going from 64 to 128 can be two to three times faster for working on these big files just because of the uh, the impact you know that you have on editing. I mean, if it's a, again, if it's a big file, I said one gigabyte, that's... <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, not uh, out of the uh, the norm, depending upon what you're involved with. But if you're working on a big file, it needs that free space in memory, whether it's filters or applying a different mass. I mean, it's, these are intense processes that use exponentially more memory than the size of the original file itself. So if you have an SSD and everything's going fast and smooth and then you start seeing beach balls, you know, whether it's in a Mac or PC, things start to kind of give you the spinning wheel. Know, while you're uh, in the process of doing something, it's probably because you could benefit from more memory. And going back to when you get memory in a system like an iMac, uh, you know, 27 inch, you can add memory anytime you want. iMac 21 and a half inch, a little more complicated process and the machines that can be upgraded, best to do it at the factory. Most laptops today, just about every laptop today, is incorporating soldered memory. Now, unless you're sure that the memory is upgradable, which it isn't in any Macintosh being manufactured that the laptop introduced after 2013. Unless you're sure that memory is upgradable, you can buy the maximum memory at the factory because you won't be able to do it later. 
I mean, more than budget. I mean, 16 gigs is probably a good minimum. You know, yeah. more if uh, you know, your, your own applications are benefit, or if you want to protect the resale value, especially in a pro system. Right, and and you know, we were talking about how long some of these systems last. Uh, future proofing is off is also a good thing to do. So 16, 32. Uh, you know, and I've seen some crazy people go up to 128, but I think 3264 would future proof you for a long time to come. So, uh, very, very I good. Agree. Unfortunately, the max, yeah. the max in the laptop from Apple today is 32, and that's actually, you know, that's more than most. I mean, a lot of PCs, some PCs go to 32, but most are, uh, you know, limited to 16 gigs as well. Right. The bottom line is, if you don't buy enough memory and then suddenly, you know, you're doing something where you could benefit from more memory, you don't want to have to buy a new laptop you know, just because you don't have enough memory. Well, you know, and, really, and it's a couple hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very interesting because uh, the most recent MacBook Pro, uh, you know, you want to talk about trends. I mean, something that Apple has never done before, just like we were talking about external storage and you could have an external hard drive just kind of plugged into a USB. Uh, I believe that with the MacBook Pro, the first time ever, Apple has uh, given people the choice to buy an external GPU, where you can buy an external graphics card that will kind of give your, you know, your your MacBook Pro a bit more oomph, a bit more processing power. Uh, I, I I don't know if we're heading to a future where it's going to be like some kind of weird octopus that you set out and it's going to have an external every component, but. Apple has kind of admitted that, you know, some things just have to be external and, you know, that's good for kind of upgrade, uh, upgradability, I guess. Well, the talk about GPUs and we introduced our first eGPUs for the Mac several months ago, actually back at NAB. The benefit there is, again, you know, the codex change and the GPU that was made a few years ago no longer has, well, obviously isn't, doesn't have, you know, support for something that just came out last week or even last year for that matter. And they have a great system that is only you know, dogging because it doesn't have GPU capability. You know, the, the H.265 came out, and none of the older GPUs uh, prior to 2015 have support for H.265. So you got a system with a great processor that goes into overload because it doesn't have the ability to, to offload the uh, the actual uh, the, how to say the uh, the codec the encoding mm -hmm. to the GPU. It's got to put it on the processor. The processor can do it but not very efficiently. And, it, you know, you have to shrink the window down. It, it's really horrible to do really anything, quite frankly, with that protocol on the older machine. But now, rather than having to, once again, look at a brand new machine, you can buy an eGPU, plug it into the Mac, and now add those, uh, those current, add the current uh, support capabilities without having to buy a new system. And Apple did this looking at saying, you know, we got iMacs, we got MacBook Pros, we got all these systems out there, Thunderbolt, that are going to last a long time. We want people to be able to develop, you know, on the, you know for the iPhone and the, uh, the iPad, these AR and VR applications. And people aren't going to be super stoked if to do these kinds of developments, they've got to buy a new machine. So now you can plug in a GPU. That gives you, whether it be gaming, whether it be photography, Photoshop, you know, Final Cut, you know, some of the different you know, video effects. Now you can plug in an eGPU and have those latest uh, GPU capabilities in a machine that otherwise is already you know, really fantastic to begin with. Right. right. You shouldn't have to buy a new machine because your GPU is soldered. Right. And of course, any laptop and pretty much any Mac that's made, you know, replacing the GPU is just not an option. And the PCs, lots of PCs, of course, still have GPU cards. That makes it really, really easy to replace a card. But, you know, going into the future, you can really have a very low-end notebook, potentially, relatively low-end, because GPUs do so much of the work. And they have a good processor but otherwise pretty well minimal for capabilities. You know, go into the, uh, your office or your home, plug in a single cable, and now it's a, a super workstation because of what you can connect externally, including that latest uh, GPU uh, for those latest video capabilities. Or just number crunching. I mean, GPUs aren't just for video. Oh, no. Uh, GPUs are actually the technology leading to, uh, as I said earlier, uh, in the computer news segment we're going to do, uh, AI. You know, I'm sure artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, uh, that is primarily GPU, you know, kind of based because that has the most, uh, you know, computational power. So, uh, and, you know, my, my, my prediction for how this whole thing is going to go is that eventually we're going to have ex uh, external storage, external graphics card, external memory, external monitor, uh, external everything, and then some 
visionary is going to come along and put it all into one machine and sell it as like a desktop or something. It's going to be beautiful. But until we get to that point, uh, before we you know uh, kind of say goodbye to you, because again, I apologize for keeping you over, but um, let's talk about your refurbished Mac division because people love Macs. They love the look of them. They have... They're 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 like nothing else out there on the market. So you know, buying a refurbished Mac is very attractive to some people. That's kind of one thing that protect that protects a Mac's resale value. So talk about your website uh, over at Mac Sales and your used Mac, uh, you know, kind of part of the website. Sure, for uh, MacSales.com, the used Mac has been one of the fastest growing areas, and you know, we've been adding uh, you know, most recently within the last couple months have really. Check out, fleshed out our configurator so you can go online you know, you know, from an available system, configure it with whatever memory, whatever drive, you know, different GPU options, you name it, that they pick the system that you need. And everything gets is extensively tested. You know, we back uh, these systems with warranty. You know, Macs last a very, very long time. You know, again, a machine that's you know, even from 20, maybe from the model, either 2011 or 2012, will still run Apple's latest new OS that's in beta right now that goes into release uh, this fall, 10.14, you know, without an issue. You know, it's, there's no other, you know, system. You just can't compare a PC to a Mac in terms of, again, because of Apple's tight control of the hardware and how the software, they say, is redesigned to, you know, to maximize that hardware. It's really amazing how well these older systems run, even the latest OS versions. And when you can plug in external capabilities, you know, you can even take things further. But, you know, we make it really, really simple to, Find a Mac that can fit your budget, you know, configure it you know, for the storage, for the memory that you need, and know that you can always come back to, to upgrade with us later. But it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, we started Fuse you know, just with Mac Pros, and over the last uh, several, I've upgraded, I should say, expanded rather to cover pretty much you know, every uh, you know, Mac segment because you know, there's a need you know, someplace for every everyone. And you know, for us as an upgrade company and, and as a designer and engineering company, so the actual upgrades that make these guys go forward. You know, it's it's always bugged me you know, how many systems are out there that never got the benefit of an upgrade. I mean, these systems that we pull out of corporate sites and schools and and even to, to a lesser extent individual uh, users, you know, a lot of them come in very minimally configured and giving those systems a second life where they can really uh, you know make a difference for somebody with a, a configuration perhaps a little more suitable to uh, what today's needs are, more memory, more storage, you know, whatnot. You know, it's a real great feeling because... Recycling is recycling is not a, a great process. It's not the most environmentally friendly process, and it's completely a waste when you got systems that are still great today. You now that you know, can be uh, continue to serve and you know, be even better tomorrow. You know, and and in that same vein, uh, I want to direct people to an interview that we did uh, earlier this month, where we talked to the Basel Action Network, who's you know made it their mission to you know really try to reduce e-waste and track e-waste and see where it goes and see what happens. It was a very interesting conversation that, you know, even if you drop your computer off to, uh, you know, to an e-waste recycler, I think they said that uh, like 60% of all e-waste, even if it's, you know, handled to the right people, somewhere along that chain, it, uh, it, it goes awry and it doesn't end up where you hope it would end up. So extending the life of computers is definitely of, of key importance. So glad that you're doing it. And uh, I think before we say goodbye, I'm going to let you have the last word. If people want to find out more or if we missed anything that you wanted to talk about, uh, where can people go and uh, yeah, anything on your mind? Certainly, yeah. You know, they can go visit uh, odcdigital.com to see the latest in our innovations for both the Mac and the PC. You know, check out uh, macsales.com you know, for you know, all of these great solutions, as well as you know, our selection of used Macs and iPads and you know, enhancements you know, from A to Z for Macs and PCs. And in general, you know, again, whether it's a Mac or a PC, whatever it may be, you know, the way it comes out of the, the box is typically nowhere near you know, what its true capability can be. It's it's not just economical. It's not just environmentally friendly. Often, I mean, it's even better than buying new to upgrade that system in terms of the performance you can get from a system that really is configured right and really you know, lets the processor go. When you got a great machine that is kind of like having a, you know, if you got a Ferrari, I don't have a Ferrari, by the way, but if you had a Ferrari <laughs> and you put donut tires on it, you know, it's it's going to do a lot of spinning in in, uh, in place. You know, give it the right tires, give it uh, the right fuel, 
and that sucker, you know, now you got a, a real race car. And a lot of these systems, people have great computers sitting on their desktops, you know, in their laptop bags, you know, that they're working on right now that, you know, probably, you know, just need, you know, a little bit, of, a little, it's not even a tune-up. It just, you know, the engine is there, just needs the, needs the, the other pieces to go around it to really let things go. So let it loose and take off. Anyhow, you know, we're always about maximizing technology and you know we encourage everybody to take a look what they got and make the most of it very very well said so of course we have links to these in the show notes and uh and yeah so i will say this that uh larry always a pleasure to have you on and very very cool to see what you guys are up to lately over at other world computing and uh and yeah so larry i think until next time i want to say thank you for joining us uh i i don't know what kind of bind you're in but uh the interview went well where was able to hear you the whole time and uh and thanks for doing this fantastic anytime you know, thanks thanks always for having us on i appreciate it our pleasure our pleasure so larry until next time have a great one Bye bye all right, and there he goes, everyone. So, yeah, OWC, you can check them out, owcdigital.com, maxsales.com, and, uh, of course, they are the official Computer America sponsor for the uh, video portion and the news segment. So, speaking of the news segment, because we only have, like, 10 minutes and I did want to get into some of these, I definitely wanted to, uh, you know, to do a computer and technology news segment. So, here we go. Computer and tech news brought to you by... OWC. Who else? Here we go. And I guess because, you know, anything having to do with Apple, you know, we just spent the whole day talking or the whole show today talking to OWC. Uh, this one is kind of Apple related, so I'm sure that there are people out there listening who have an iPhone, and if that's the case, then you need to listen up. There is a new phishing scam that we should probably alert you to, and this has to do with Ars Technica. They, this is the publication we found it from, making the rounds, but Mr. Sean Gallagher talking about a here we go uh, an iOS phishing scam, and you'll be connected to quote unquote Apple Care. So here we go, saying that India-based tech support scams have taken a new turn, using phishing emails targeting Apple users to push them to a fake Apple website. And this phishing attack also comes with a twist where it pops up a system dialog box to start a phone call. Hmm. All right, so they're getting, uh, they're getting more technical. And they said that the, in the intricacy of this phish and the formatting of the web page could convince some users that their phone has been locked for illegal activity, which would never happen, but okay. And by Apple luring users into the soon click uh, into soon clicking to complete the call. And so I guess this uh, the software gets onto your phone, says that your iPhone has been locked due to illegal activity. Immediately call, and then it asks to call uh, a number, an eight 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 number. And saying that the scammers are following the money, whereas more people use mobile devices as their primary or sole way of connecting to the internet, phishing attacks and other scams have increasingly targeted mobile users. And since so much of the people's lives are tied to mobile devices, they're, you know, they're pretty attract, uh, they're pretty attractive targets because people obviously are going to want access to their one and only computer. So they said that this particular fish targeted at email addresses associated with the Apple iCloud service appears to be linked to, ef to, uh, to efforts to fool iPhone users into allowing attackers to enroll them into rogue mobile device management systems that allow bad actors to push compromised applications onto the phone as part of a fraudulent Apple security service. So it's not even just like the one-off, hey, you're an Apple support, give us your bank information, you know, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. But it's actually, uh, even beyond that, they want to continuously uh, access your phone, push bad malware onto your phone, and just, you know, siphon as much money as they can from you. So, and by the way, the author of the article was actually able to uh, bluff his way through, uh, through a call to the support number and collect intelligence on the scam, where the person answering the call, who identified himself as Lance Roger, 
from Apple Care, a great name, great made up name, became suspicious of me and hung up before I could get too far into the script. So obviously, you know, he tried to uh, go as far as he could without actually giving up uh, any device or money of his own. So they're saying that while the site is still active, it is now marked as deceptive by Apple and Google and saying that he passed technical details of the phishing site to an Apple security team member. So the scam is obviously targeted at the same audience as Windows tech support scams. And uh, yeah, just be aware of it, that if your phone is locked for illegal activity, quote unquote, then probably better to just wipe the phone or figure out how to get that kind of uh, malware off. So, all right, so there's that. One of the other big stories for, for today includes another application for machine learning or artificial intelligence. And this has to do with the fact that, well, you can look, and like, I feel like they don't even need an AI to do this. So have you ever been to a movie theater where they play the, ever increasing amount of previews before a movie and I don't know about you but for me there's always people in the audience that, that go that doesn't look good or I want to see that or I'm not going to go see that there's always people that will tell you their opinion with no provocation well I guess they were tired of listening to people making stupid comments and they decided that hey we can make an AI to do this on our own so Fox AI predicts a movie audience based on its trailer. So modern movie trailers are already cynical exercises in attention grabbing, and but they might be even more calculated in the future, where researchers at 20th Century Fox have produced a deep learning system that can predict who will be most likely to watch a movie based on the trailer. So thanks to training that linked hundreds of trailers to movie audience records, the AI can draw a connection between visual elements in the trailer, such as colors, faces, landscape, and lighting. So some of your cliches. And the performance of a film for certain demographics. So they know that if we show a lot of mountains and a lot of quick flashes of light and this, that, or the other, then that really excited the 18 to 29 crowd and they are the ones who will go see this movie because it looks exciting and full of energy. Well, I guess they're trying to do that, but with AI. So notably the deep learning approach already appears to be uh, to work in real world conditions where while Fox did use existing movies as benchmarks, it also had success anticipating the performance of future movies. And sure enough, the visual cues and a brand new movie trailer gave an idea as to what attendance would be several months later. It's pretty scary. Although, as far as I've heard it, there was uh, there was something uh, there was something to do with this, where certain movies just supremely confuse artificial intelligence, where you can take outliers of movies that weren't supposed to be critically successful or even, you know, cult successful, but then they did become cult classics. And those are the movies, like those strange one-off movies are going to be the ones that suffer in this new future. In this new future where everything is pre-planned, everything is uh, homogenized, everything is to a T structured to the point where they can get you to go see this movie regardless uh, whether or not it's good. That's where your Napoleon Dynamites, that's where your, oh, I, I don't know, what other movies that are like on like a lower budget, but they're strange, but they're loved and they're beloved. So the movie industry, if, if nothing else, is about to become much, much more linear, I guess. So everyone, the music in the, mass, in the background means that we are just about done for today. And I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to thank our guest, OWC Digital, for joining us. And you can check them out at OWCDigital.com or go ahead and check out the show notes at ComputerAmerica.com. So until next time, everyone, I want you to have a great day. Be sure to tune back in Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. And yeah, just uh, tune in. Let me see. Uh, tomorrow on the program, if we can pull that up real quick. 
we will have let's see let's see i think we got this tomorrow the program we have scott schober scheduled to be on uh, on the show so he was supposed to be on last week but we had a mix-up and so tomorrow all things security so until next time everyone have a great day thank you so much bye bye